So now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our internationally known keynote speakers. Cable Green, who is director of the Open Education at Creative Commons, and David Wiley, who is co-founder and chief academic officer at Lumen Learning. You can read their bios in the, the stuff they want you to know about them uh, in the program. What I want to say is, again, one more round of thanks here to both of them. When I uh, called them, emailed them, and told them about Senate Bill 494 and the fact that this had the, the potential to really pivot things in Maryland for us, uh, both of them very generously said to me, let us know what we can do and how we can contribute our time. So as you can see, I didn't forget that. They're both here today. Um, I've had the pleasure of listening to both of them speak individually. Uh, but this is a rare opportunity to hear them uh, present together. So please join me in welcoming to the, to, this, to the stage Cable Green and David Wiley. They're going to speak to us on the changing landscape of OER and higher education. All right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. You want me to go first, right? Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here is our contact information. We give you our emails, but we don't read our emails. And so uh, if you want to get our attention, you can contact us on Twitter. It's really the best place to get us. Um, it's also a good place if you want to stay up to speed on what we're working on and what others are working on that we follow. It's a good place, and then we'll follow you back and, and follow your good work. Uh, we also want to let you know that all of these slides, of course, are under an open license. They're under a Creative Commons attribution license. Uh, and if you don't know what that means yet, you certainly will by the end of today's conversation. And with that, uh, let me turn it over to my colleague, David. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Well, we're so excited to be here, and it really is fun to uh, sit between two ferns and have this conversation <laughs> with you this morning. We are between two ferns. We are. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to start with the proposition that education is sharing. And I want to try to persuade you that that is true for a moment. Now, I understand that there are some things that we share that have nothing to do with education. And there are some things we do in education writ large that have nothing to do with sharing, like hunting for parking, as we already talked about today. But the <laughs> core educative acts really are all acts of sharing. They're acts of you know, primarily sharing the things you know with your students, your expertise, and your skills, and your attitudes, your ethics, your commitment. It's about sharing feedback with students on work that they turn into you. When they're trying to help you understand where they are in their learning, you're giving feedback to them. You're sharing your thoughts and your understanding of how they can get better and how they can improve. Sharing encouragement with them when they walk through the door and tell you about what's happened with their car, or with their child, or with their parent, and how they think they have to drop, or they know they just can't do this. And you have a role to play there in sharing encouragement with them and helping them understand that they can be successful. Um, sharing your passion for your discipline. I don't know about each of you, but every time I teach, I want people coming out of my classes to want to grow up to be an educator when they're done. I want to have that effect and that impact on them. And if you think about uh, the one or two faculty or maybe teachers back in K-12 who really changed your life and are the reasons that you're sitting in this room, it's because you had a faculty member or a teacher who actually shared something of themselves with you. And it was beyond professional. And it became personal. Um, so education really is about sharing. It's about sharing all of these things. Fortunately, uh, as we just heard, there's this thing called the internet, which isn't going anywhere. Thank you. Um, and the internet is really about sharing as well. When you think about most of the services that you use there, you're sharing some kind uh, of media with others that you know, or even people that you don't know in that context. And the sharing that we can do online is different from sharing that we do in real life, uh, in that that sharing can be global and it can be instantaneous. And that's really a different thing, a thing that's never existed in the world before. That gives us an unprecedented capacity to share. We can share globally and we can share immediately uh, via the internet. And that unprecedented capacity to share gives us an unprecedented capacity to do education in as much as education is a form of sharing, except that it doesn't. It doesn't. No, thank you. Uh, <laughs> because long before the internet was even a gleam in an engineer's eye, there was copyright. 
And all the kinds of things that we share online, whether it's words or sounds or images or moving images or games or simulations or other kinds of interactives, each and every one of those things is by default subject to copyright. And so it puts us in this unusual place where the internet gives us this great technical capability, but the law prohibits us from engaging it fully. And uh, you know, as a faculty member in instructional technology kinds of programs, I'm very interested by this tension. It's, uh, it's almost like I feel like I'm trying to educate with one arm tied behind my back, because I know there's more that I can do, but I'm not permitted to do. And so uh, that's where open educational resources come in. The answer to this problem isn't to violate copyright all over the place. The answer to this problem is to find a middle way in terms of open educational resources. And I'm going to hand it over to Cable now to talk about when we say open, what do we actually mean by open? Open just means free, right? Well, not quite. And <laughs> You know, you're talking, David, about the internet and these new opportunities. Maybe later in a session today we can talk about uh, net neutrality a little bit and how that might <laughs> throttle some of our abilities, uh, no pun intended. Yeah. So, uh, so we're going to talk about three big things today, uh, permissions, price, and pedagogy. You heard some of the, in, uh, the introductions talk about price and cost and access, critical, but we always start with talking about permissions for a very good reason. First, as David, as David said, open is not the same as free. Oftentimes, we, people get uh, this, this, uh, this misconception. They say, oh, everything I've got in my class is freely available to the students. But our first question is, well, is that content open? Because open's not the same as free. Most of the content that we all find on the web is free. Now, we know it's not really free. We're paying with it through Google Ads and through other, uh, uh, giving our attention, uh, letting people broadcast advertisements to us. So we, it's not free in that sense, but we're not paying cash for it. You don't have to put your credit card in for it. Uh, but any of this content, of course, in these walled gardens could disappear tomorrow. It could become a paid service or it could be altered in a way that you can no longer use the content in the way that you want to. Does anybody use SlideShare in here to either put your slides up or to, sh to look, find other people's slides? Anybody notice what happened to SlideShare about three weeks ago? Shout it out. So all of us are uploading editable file formats. We're sharing PowerPoint files, we're sharing keynote slides, things that other people can download and reuse our slides. Uh, SlideShare got bought by LinkedIn. LinkedIn took all of our content, changed it into a lockdown PDF format, and so now nobody can edit our slides that, that we own and that we've given to a platform. It's just one example of where we, we turn things over, they can, they can be altered. So open, what we want when we're talking about things that are open is, yes, we want them to be free, but we want them to be flexible. We want them to meet our needs, to meet our students' needs. And much of what's on the web is not open. Much of it is freely available, but it's precarious. It's rigid. It doesn't give us the permissions that we need. So when we're talking about open, open educational resources, open pedagogy, we're really talking about permissions. We're starting with permissions. And this guy sitting to my left here came up with what he called the R's. He used to have four R's, and I guess four, four wasn't enough. Yes. And so he added a fifth. More. I, I'm waiting for the sixth R. We don't know what it is yet, but we're all very excited. So these are the five R's, and the reason that these are important is that when we talk about whether or not something is an open educational resource, it has to meet this criteria to be an OER. And when I say has to, what I mean by that is the global open education community has talked about this at length and has basically said, yeah, we've got to have the legal rights. We have to have the permissions to do these things. So very quickly, the first one is retain. I have to be able to keep a copy. I'm going to talk in just a minute about how that right is being taken away from us right now in K-12 and in higher ed. Second R is I have to be able to reuse it. I have to be able to take a copy of that UMUC course or some of the content in that course that's OER, it's openly licensed, and download it exactly as it is. I live in Washington State. The University of Washington has to be able to reuse it exactly as UMUC built it. They also have to be able to revise it. 
So maybe we don't like the examples they used here in Maryland. Maybe we're a bunch of hippies in the Northwest. We like salmon and trees. And so maybe we want to change up the examples. We want to revise it. Maybe we want to remix that content. I want to take some of the UMUC content, remix it with some MIT open courseware, and a bit of OER from the University of Barcelona. I'm going to remix a new, a new mashup. And then redistribute that new thing, that new set of OER that we built. We can put it on the web, and we can share it with anybody else in the world that we choose to. And we can do all five of these R's without asking permissions, without getting lawyers involved, without writing custom licenses. We have the legal rights to do these things. And so retain is a prerequisite to doing any of the other R's. So I, I warned that this right's being taken away from us. Something to keep an eye out for are what we call artificial scarcity models or what the publishers, uh, are there any publishers in the room today? <laughs> Good, let's talk about them. <laughs> so first of all, let me say that we're not up here on stage to bash publishers. We are not anti-business, we're not anti-capitalist, uh, we're not any of that. What we are is we're pro-students, we're pro-efficiencies, we're pro-effectiveness. And our business is to use the tools of the day, the internet, open licensing, things being digital, to leverage permissions to give full access to everybody on the planet to educational opportunities that they don't have today. That's the business that we're in. And one of the new models, and I'll use an example um, here in the Northeast, one of your states which shall remain nameless, actually has a committee right now uh, with publishers sitting down with state leaders saying, we'd like to initiate an inclusive access model. So if OER gets all of your students 100% of the access they need on day one, which it does, uh, we the publishers can do that as well. You pay us a certain amount of money, uh, we will give 100% access to your students, but the artificial scarcity is at the end of the semester, we take the access away. Or the moment your institution stops paying the lease fee, we take the access away. And that's different than open, because with open, we get to keep it forever. So this is where I work. I work at Creative Commons. Anybody heard of Creative Commons before? <laughs> oh, this is good. So we're a, we're a global nonprofit organization. Uh, we build the open copyright licenses, or the open licenses that the world uses to share. Uh, we're, we're, we're old in internet terms. We were founded in 2001. Uh, we work in every country in the world. The licenses work in every country in the world. And we've got formal teams of volunteers in 89 countries around the world. And we add about one per month. Why does Creative Commons exist? Well, quite simply because we've got two extremes. David talked about copyright, all rights reserved copyright on one extreme. You can't do anything with copyrighted materials unless you've got permission or unless your government has provided you limitations or exceptions to copyright. Now, we're lucky in the United States that we have something called fair use, and then we've got the Teach Act on top of that for, for educators. And so we've got quite a bit of coverage for using copyrighted materials without permission for some purposes under certain circumstances. But even there, we have to be careful and thoughtful about how we exercise our fair use. On the other end of the spectrum is public domain. Librarians in the room, put your hands up. How long does it take for something to go into the public domain for David Wiley's stuff? Somebody shout it out. 70 years, but what has to happen first to David? <laughs> David has to die, right? So my It'll happen. It will happen. It will happen. You're getting a little gray on top. It may happen sooner than later. I tease him because I still have more hair and we're only six months apart. So David has to die, and then 70 years have to go by, and then David's work go into the public domain. So David started asking in 2000, how do I share with all of you without having to die first and wait 70 years, right? And the, there was no answer to that without David getting an expensive lawyer and writing each one of you a custom license. So that's Creative Commons. We sit in the middle of that and we say, look, don't die and wait 70 years. Instead, why don't you keep your copyright and then add an, a license to your work so that you can share as the author under the terms and conditions that you choose. And these are the terms and conditions. So all of our licenses require attribution. Somebody uses your stuff, they have to give you credit. In the academy, we, we get that. If we don't give people credit, that's bad. We call that plagiarism, and we get fired, and we give our students F. So attribution, no problem. The other three are optional. Share alike means if somebody takes your work and they modify it, they have to 
license their new work under the same terms that you licensed your original work. So that's Wikipedia. Everything on Wikipedia is under attribution, share alike. Non-commercial is what it sounds like. You can use my work for free, you can modify it, but you can't sell it. You can't put my, my work up on the web and charge $20 for it. No, no derivatives is you can't change my work. So when you take these different conditions and you mix and mash them together, you get one of six Creative Commons open licenses. You've probably seen these around the web. We also have two public domain tools. So if David doesn't want to die first and wait 70 years for his work to go into the public domain, he can actually use our public domain dedication called CC0, and he can give up his copyright and put it in the public domain today if he wants to. So for example, Creative Commons dedicated all of our licenses to the public domain using our public domain tool. And that way, if Creative Commons vanished tomorrow, the stuff's there forever, right? Nobody has to ask. When we're talking about education, we stack these licenses and public domain tools up in a very intentional way. And so when we're, we're talking about them in terms of most freedom to least freedom, and by most freedom I mean how much freedom are we going to give other educators, other users, other students around the world. So if we put something in the public domain, that's as free as you can get, right? Not even attribution is required, although we still do give attribution when we use somebody's work in the public domain. The CC BY license, that's the attribution only license. That's the most kind of open license because the only requirement is you have to give credit. And then you move into SA and NC, SA is share alike, NC is non-commercial. And we get down, and when we get down to the bottom, you see the no derivatives licenses and it says not OER. The reason it's not OER is you cannot do the five R's with the no derivatives licenses. We can't revise and we can't remix. And in education, that's what we do. I mean, what are the odds that, that University of Washington is going to take a degree program or a course from UMUC and use it exactly as it is without changing a single thing? The odds are almost zero. Educators change stuff. That's, that's what we do. So we like to say we put the open in OER because the OER around the world has Creative Commons licenses on it or it's in the public domain. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's over, this was last year's data. This year's data looks like it's going to be a lot more than this. We don't have the final numbers yet, so I'll... I'll uh, wait until our new State of the Commons report comes out, uh, but we do publish this every year. We keep track of the data, and I'll be the first to say our analytics are not very good. The number is significantly larger than this, and we'll report that out this year. So when we talk about the permissions, these are not just one-time permissions. They're not temporary permissions. These are perpetual. They last forever. When you put a Creative Commons license on something, nobody can take it away from you. Nobody can reach into your course and yank it out. There's no artificial scarcity. There's no inclusive access models, which are going to take the content away from your students. Think about those models for a minute. Imagine a student taking pre-calculus at your institution, leaving that course and going into calculus, and they look back, and all their pre-calc materials are gone. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that's what happens when I sell my book back to the bookstore. That is what happens when you sell. You know, and David, my child, just moved from fifth grade to sixth grade in the K-12 they took all of his materials away as if to say, good luck in sixth grade. Everything you learned, we hope you memorized because all those materials are now gone. You don't need to review anything. You don't need to review anything, right? Let's just, we hope everybody remembers. So when we talk about permissions, we break the five R's up this way, right? Content is free. We heard this before with OER. That's the retain, the reuse, the redistribute. When we've got those permissions, we know the content's free. It's free forever. But what gets really interesting, David's going to talk about this a little bit later, is the revise and remix. What are the new, innovative, creative uh, ways that we can alter the content, modify it to meet our needs, and get students involved in co-creation of knowledge when we've got permissions? So when we're talking, again, to, to drive this point home, when we're talking about open educational resources, free is not enough. So if you've got a course and all the materials are free, if it's not openly licensed or if it's not in the public domain, please don't call your course Open Educational Resources. It's not. It's not. If it's open, that means that David and I can come to your course, can come to your UMUC course, we can download the whole course, and it's got sufficient permissions on it, legal permissions, licensed permissions, that we can modify it to meet our needs. So not only is it free, but we can modify it. So when you're making choices as faculty, when you're choosing traditional copyrighted materials, realize this, right? All these great things that the internet enables, making copies for zero cost, transmitting it around the world at near speeds of light, collaborating with scholars around the world who work in your field. All these amazing things that the internet does, copyright, 
for bids. When you choose open educational resources, all these great things that the internet enables, open permits. So just a few more things about price and cost before we talk about the more interesting parts of permissions. This is a chart uh, from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's the consumer price index over time is that bottom dotted line. Uh, and this is from the years 2006 to 2016. So this is a decade of how prices have changed. The top two lines are higher education. That top blue line is the cost of tuition over time. Guess what the top yellow line is? Cost of textbooks, that's right. And over that period of time, cost of textbooks went up 88%. Right, so textbooks are expensive. Here's what it looks like at your institutions. Doesn't matter if you're looking at community colleges, doesn't matter if you're looking at universities, the average cost of books and supplies vary around $1,200 to $1,300 a year. If we had our fellow publishers up on stage, they would say the number is more like six to $700 a year. And they're right that that's what students are increasingly paying but that's not the assigned materials. And so here's what students are actually doing when textbooks are expensive. Two thirds of your students, not just our students in Utah and Washington State, but your students in, in Maryland, are not buying all of the educational resources that you as faculty have assigned. How many faculty have ever had students not buy all the resources for their classes, right? And that sucks, that's not good because you as faculty have designed your course very specifically for your students to be successful in your course. And when they don't have what you've assigned, they can't be as successful. Half, half of the students, and by the way, this is uh, US Perg's research data from 2014. This research has been uh, replicated in Florida and California, and we see the same results. It's also been replicated in other countries. Half of students say, look, when textbooks are expensive, it impacts how many and which classes I take. So there's two important points here. I was gonna take two classes, but because the textbook in my chem class was $175, I can't afford to take that second class, and so I guess I can only take one class this semester. This happens a lot in community college, where students are working a job, and they're taking one or two classes at a time. It's also affecting which classes they take. Students say, I really wanted to be a nurse, or I really wanted to be an engineer, but I went in and I looked at the cost of the instructional materials for nursing, and they're prohibitively expensive, so I guess I can't go into allied health. And that's really sad. People are actually changing their career decisions based on the cost of educational resources. And then 82%, I mean, students aren't stupid. Students say, look, <laughs> when the materials are expensive and I can't afford them, I know that I'm not gonna do as well in the class as I would have otherwise done. Back to you, my friend. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we've talked about, is it free, is it no cost, is it low cost? I wanna say for a minute that I think OER is like sunshine. I think this is the best metaphor for OER. And sunshine is absolutely free, will be free, I guess the sun will die eventually, but even our copyrights will have expired by then. It's a very long time away. It's more than 70 years. More, more than. That's good. Sunshine's absolutely free, and there are a number of really interesting and useful things that you can do with the sunshine that rains down uh, freely in your backyard, like you can grow plants. <laughs> but if you want to use sunshine to run your air conditioning, or sunshine to run the Wi-Fi, or sunshine to do a range of other things, it takes some technology, it takes some expertise, it takes integration with your existing infrastructure to make the sunshine, which is free, do those useful things that you want them to do. So even though the sunshine is free, there are costs sometimes associated with making sunshine do the things you want it to do, putting it to work in the ways that you want to put it to work. Similarly, OER are absolutely free. That's part of what you get from those 5R permissions. When you have permission to make all the copies that you want, and give those copies away to everyone else, it means that the content will be free. And there are a lot of things that you can do with a PDF copy of static content. But if you want your uh, OER to be tightly integrated into the LMS, you want it to report grades back into your gradebook, you want those interactives and simulations to be able to drive personalization of the student experience, there's some technology that's gonna to have to be associated with that. It's gonna take some expertise in terms of instructional design or somebody with some learning science background to help that happen. Um, and maybe that's all that we'll say about price. So I wanna spend most of my time talking about pedagogy. What would it mean for pedagogy to be enabled by OER? How, how is it possible that OER could make pedagogy different? Um, 
I, I think there's broad agreement, although we're academics, so we can find ways to disagree about anything. I think there's broad agreement that we learn by the things that we do. We learn by doing. It's certainly true that the, the purpose and function of copyright is to restrict us or prohibit us from doing certain things without going and acquiring permissions and paying licensing fees and things like that. But if we learn by what we do, and if the function of copyright is to restrict the things we do, then copyright restricts us from learning in certain ways. Open removes those restrictions and gives us permission to engage in these activities we haven't been able to engage in before. And so is it possible that there are ways that we can learn in the context of open that we couldn't previously? And I, I want to suggest to you that the answer to that question is yes. Um, I have a particular soapbox about what I call disposable assignments. These are assignments, um, I guess maybe the best way to think about a disposable assignment is an assignment where everyone involved in that process, and by that I mean you and the students, everybody knows that the ultimate destiny of that assignment is the garbage can. <laughs> you're going to ask them to go write this very long research paper or create whatever artifact it is that you're going to ask them to create. They're going to invest a lot of time in doing it. You're going to do something between spend a lot of very careful time grading it or grading it while watching a football game. You're going to give it back to them. They're not even going to read the feedback, likely. They're going to look to see what their grade was, and it's going to go straight into the bin. That's just frustrating for everybody involved. Um, students hate doing this kind of work. I know I don't enjoy grading that kind of work. And it seems like there's a missed opportunity here. I think a quick back of the envelope, I think students just higher ed, just in the United States, spend something like 40 million hours a year doing this kind of work. Not attending class, not reading to get ready for class, actually creating artifacts that will eventually be thrown away. So is there some way that we could think about the permissions that OPEN provides to us that could allow us to ask students to engage in different kinds of activities, activities that could actually add value to the world, have a life beyond uh, what happens to them just in our classroom that they might, this is going to sound like a stunner, that they might enjoy doing, and even more shockingly, that we might enjoy grading. No. Yes. D David, can you go back one slide to the, yes, this one. So 40 million hours a year students do homework. Uh, it makes me think of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So you're saying the students could help solve problems, right? The UN. You're getting ahead of me, Green. Oh, well, geez. So, well, please go ahead. <laughs> I've tried to be helpful over here. I, uh, everybody wants to feel like their work matters. Like Cable's <laughs> comment just now, he wants to feel like that comment mattered to me. But it didn't. <laughs> it was not helpful. It, it's, it's so easy to forget that students are people. People want to feel like their work matters. You have had a committee assignment before, which you went to every one of those meetings just knowing that nothing productive was going to happen there. <laughs> and, and it is soul crushing to engage in that kind of effort that is unproductive and to know that you've got a year of that assignment ahead of you. And students feel the same way. Everyone wants to feel like their work matters. And we miss on opportunities to help students feel that way about the work that they do for us. I, I think there's some things we can do. And I want to just share two quick examples. One is uh, a course that I used to teach when I was still full-time faculty. I'm an adjunct now. Um, which, by the way, switching from being full-time and having tenure to being adjunct is an interesting path. Um, and we can talk about that later. But I used to teach this class called Project Management for Instructional Designers. There is no textbook about project management for instructional designers, as you might imagine. This course is maybe taught 60 or 70 places around the country. It's kind of a niche course. Um, but I found some OER about project management that were very close to what I needed, close to what I wanted, maybe 80% of the way there. Um, and other, under other circumstances, I would have looked at it, felt depressed, disappointed. That was really close to what I needed. I would have gone on and looked for something else. But these were OER. And I realized uh, that I could take these OER and I could change them for. All the examples in this collection were about the business school and business context and shipping and the logistics of this and that. And it wouldn't have spoken to my students at all. My students are, are uh, education students. But I realized I could change all the examples in this book to be education examples. 
I could change it in a, in a bunch of ways to really make it speak more directly to my students. And then I started thinking about how much work that was going to be. And then realized that what I really ought to do is have students do this work with me. Have students edit the textbook for their class to make it speak more directly to them. And so over the sequence of, of years in which I taught this course, groups of students got together and they each took on very specific kinds of assignments uh, in the context of this book to update it to make it more directly useful to us. So one group of students in the first semester said, we'll take all the little yellow boxes that pull out many case studies and we'll write, rewrite every one of those to be about something that we care about and that makes sense to us. And I have to tell you that when you think about the amount of learning and understanding a student has to demonstrate in order to pass a quiz relative to what they have to demonstrate to create a new example that exemplifies the principles that we're talking about, it's a different, it's a different level of understanding that they have to demonstrate. And they do that work knowing that once it gets to a sufficiently high quality bar, and we're going to go back and forth on that, that that work is going to go into the textbook. And next semester students are going to read their work as part of the required instructional materials. And that gets them thinking about that work that they're doing in a different way. It's not going to be thrown away. It's going to be useful to someone. And now I'm not grading work so much as I'm editing contributions by students to the textbook. And that gets me feeling about the efforts that I make in a different way as well. Uh, in a slightly more fun example, um, instead of compare and contrast kind of essays, which is something that is not uh, uncommon to ask students to do. I, en I really enjoy asking students to do what I call a kung fu assignment. How many kung fu fans in the, come on. I like kung fu. Jackie Chan, old Jackie Chan, like good Jackie Chan. Um, for me, the defining characteristic of these old kung fu movies is that what's happening with the person's mouth is never in sync with what's happening in the audio. <laughs> in the movie, which gives it a certain charm that's just amazing. Um, and I love that. And so I started asking students, hey, let's go out and let's find either some openly licensed video or some public domain video, because both of those give us those 5R permissions. And instead of writing a compare and contrast essay, in this case, about what's the difference between blogs and wikis, let's rewrite and record new audio over top of the old video to make the video teach me something about this topic. So in this case, instead of asking this group of students to each write little compare and contrast essays about the difference between blogs and wikis, they got together and said, what, like, what kind of video, what, how, can, how can we best exemplify these principles in a way that is really going to be fun? And they found this old debate footage of Kennedy and Nixon. <laughs> and they rewrote and recorded audio with like terrible pretending to do accents of Nixon and Kennedy <laughs> uh, audio over top of it, in which Nixon is really arguing uh, in behalf of blogs. Blogs are important. Blogs are wonderful. The great thing about blogs is you can control the information that's available to the public and to the media. He talks about the Watergate blog, which he recently launched, <laughs> and, and how he's able to delete comments that he thinks are inappropriate <laughs> from his blog. Are the versions of the blog being recorded by Nixon? Uh, no. I, I, I couldn't say. No. He didn't talk about that part. Right. Uh, but Kennedy talks about wikis and how wikis, everyone can participate in a wiki. They're democratizing. They're about freedom of speech. They're about all these great American values. And if you've ever been to a conference where they said, you know, we don't want the conversation at this conference to end when we all go home, we, we, we've set up a wiki so everyone can continue talking to each other you know that you only get out of wikis what you actually put into it. A wiki isn't magical. You have to actually invest some effort there. And Kennedy closes his remarks by pounding on the pulpit saying, ask not what your wiki can do for you, <laughs> but what you can do for your wiki. I mean, this is amazing, amazing work, OK? And in a previous version of this course, these were two-page, sad, depressing <laughs> compare and contrast essays. And this one piece of student homework has been viewed over 50,000 times, OK? And do you think students engaged in this work in a different way than they do with kind of essay work, where they're basically just trying to prove to me that they read the assignment? You bet they do. And when they show these to each other in class, 
Boy, after the first one, it's on. Everybody is now competing to see who's going to be the cleverest, who's going to be the smartest, who's going to be the clearest. And my work to try to motivate them to, to learn a lot, it's over. They're just competing with each other now. And every student in this, every student in this class gets an A. And after the first two weeks, they forget that grades even exist. It's just all about reputation between them and the other students. It's really amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So there's a lot that can be done. But I, I want to pull back from that for a minute and talk about how we get from the kind of advocacy work that most of us in this room, I think, probably do around OER to how we get OER to be really mainstream. Advocates are, are special people. Advocates are people who will build their own mode of transportation, will hunt, kill, cook their own food, they'll go where there's no road. Like, advocates are super dedicated, and it's awesome, and we need advocates, they're important. But for OER use to become mainstream, we have to realize not everybody's an advocate, right? Most people just want to buy a car that somebody else made, and they want to drive it on a road that somebody else paved, and they want to go eat dinner at a place that has already been built and where someone else is kind of taking care of food. And they're just normal people trying to get other stuff done in their life, right? Like most, most faculty don't want to become dedicated to sitting down and writing open textbooks from scratch, spending hundreds of hours doing that. There's a difference between kind of crazy people like us and normal people. And I think we have to realize that. It's kind of the difference between saying, when you think to yourself, you know what sounds really good right now? You always want a cookie. I always want a cookie. A cookie sounds great. When, you, when most people think, I would love a cookie, they don't think, you know what the first thing I should do is, is go to Google and search, look, there's, there's 8.4 million recipes for cookies on Google. And I'll browse through those for 10 or 15 hours. And I'll find one that looks good, and then I'll go to the store. And then I'll bake cookies. And when you think, you know what sounds great is a cookie. You want a cookie, right? You don't want to engage in all of that other stuff. And I think this is what's really important for us to understand about mainstreaming OER is when someone says, you know, I'd really like to teach my intro to psych class with OER. That doesn't mean, you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to go hit Google and find 128,000 results. And this is the restricted Google uh, advanced search where it's only showing me OER search results. Okay, so I don't want to, I don't, I don't want 128,000 OER about introduction to psychology. I want one place where that's all been brought together with pacing information and quiz and answer banks and assignments and discussions and power. I, I, I want a cookie. <laughs> I actually do want a cookie. We'll get you a cookie. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and this is the kind of support that we have to provide if OER adoption is going to become mainstream. It would also be nice if there were some research about the impact of OER use. Um, now, you know, I wear a couple of hats, and so sometimes it gets confusing to follow, and I appreciate that. But I'm still adjunct faculty at Brigham Young in their graduate program on educational technology, and I have a research group there, and we still do work of this sort. And these next two slides are actually results from a paper published in a journal that MJ was the editor of at the time. I don't know, MJ, are you still the editor of that? She is. Yeah, she is. Um, you know, so what you see here is in the middle column here, you see a completion chi-square. That's did students complete the class, yes or no? A C minus or better chi-square. Did they receive a C minus or better higher grade, yes or no? And then on the far right-hand side, kind of their course grade on a scale of 0 to 4, a continuous kind of measure. And we're comparing here students who used OER and students that used traditional materials. And a lot of what you see here is NS. There's no significant difference. We saved students a ton of money and did no harm to their learning. But most of what you see are blue boxes that say T is greater than C. That's treatment greater than control. That's where students whose faculty assigned them OER instead of traditional materials statistically outperformed students who were assigned traditional materials. And there's a cut, you see these two boxes where the control group outperformed treatment in this business class. And there's a follow-on study that we published about that. But it turns out that, uh, that OER work, uh, which some people have, have an intuition about the idea that if something's free, it must not be very, very good. Because your mom taught you that 
I heard it. Say it louder. You get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. So this free stuff that's available on some interweb, something can't possibly be as good as that $180 thing I'm currently using. That's an intuition that a lot of people have. But there's lots and lots of data now suggesting that that's not true. And to Cable's earlier point about people taking fewer courses, we actually found that that happens. And we asked this question because in some survey data collected in the state of Virginia, students were asked, what do you do with the money that you save on textbooks? And they all stood up tall and proudly. And they put their hands over their hearts and they said, we reinvest that money in our education. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think maybe Papa John should be funding the global OER movement because I think that's where your money is going. Um, but so we asked this question. And we asked this question by actually pulling SIS data across multiple institutions, 16,000 students, and looking. And you'll see here in this left-hand column, or on the top row for fall there, that's the semester when they were assigned to use OER. Students who were assigned to use OER took over two credits more than their peers who were assigned to use traditional materials. So they do take more courses. It accelerates them forward. Let me say just a couple of things about what mainstreaming looks like very close to the ground, and then I'm going to leave it to cable to take us back up to 30,000 feet. Just four points, two for faculty and two for administrators. The first for faculty is I think, you know, there's all this OER-enabled pedagogy and getting students involved and doing different kinds of, there's all kinds of exciting stuff about OER, but that can sound and can be quite overwhelming. So when it comes to mainstreaming OER, I think we should encourage people, look, adopt first and you can adapt later. Like just get some OER and start using it. Start saving students money, start seeing those differences and those small differences in learning outcomes, and then grow into this OER enabled pedagogy piece of it. You don't have to fully commit to redesign everything that you're doing to, just to adopt OER. <coughs> the second I would say is to leverage the technology that's available to help with using OER because no one wants to save students money and in so doing take their learning backward or take their experience backward, or take your experience backward. If you're a math instructor, and the idea of adopting OER is that instead of this textbook and my lab and this other thing that automatically grades homework for you, we can save students money by giving them a PDF instead, and you can grade all of their homework by hand again. No one's going back to that world, right? You, you don't want that, and students don't want it. Students appreciate immediate feedback. It tells them if they're getting it right or getting it wrong. That's way more useful than getting feedback seven days later when you finally return my homework to me that you've graded by hand. Nobody involved in this process wants that. So as you're making this transition to OER, keep your eye on technology that's designed to help with OER in terms of homework platforms or, or other personalized capabilities designed for OER. For administrators, I think on the ground what this looks like is support without require. Right? We, you can't require faculty to do things. We all know that. We all appreciate that. If I stood up right now and commanded all of you to breathe, there are people in this room who would pass out rather than do what they were told <laughs> because you have academic freedom and you can't be told what to do. Here, here. Right? I, I'm one of those people, actually. We can provide incentives. We can provide support. There's lots that we can do to enable we should never try to require. And finally, plan, plan for sustainability. It's great to fund a pilot with one-time funding, but mainstreaming means something that everyone is doing and everyone's going to do it long term. And things like um, updating OER. So uh, we, some colleagues of mine at Lumen just went through a process of a major revision of some OER about marketing. One of the case studies in this collection of OER about marketing that was still being used until we did this update was blackberries. <laughs> That's about what they look like, too. Yeah, it's not quite this nice. <laughs> um, somebody needs to update, update and maintain these materials. Somebody needs to continue to support faculty. Somebody needs to continue to host and secure and update the technology. All those costs are ongoing costs. They're not one-time costs. 
And so to do this mainstream where everyone participates and it's happening at scale, we have to think about how we fund these things. Dr. Green, back to you. So David put this point of sustainability in here just to, just to get me angry. Bump, <laughs> bump, set. set, and hit that spike. <laughs> here it comes. So oftentimes when we talk about sustainability of open education, it gets framed up in a very particular way. Usually that the open education project is a pilot. It's something we're going to try. It's that one-off project that we got a little grant money for. It's an experiment that we're trying at a system level. And when we talk about sustaining projects in that way, I think we're missing the point. Because I would argue that if you look at, and it doesn't matter what country you look at, if you're looking at a state or province, a system of education, an individual education institution, K-12 or higher ed, if we sit down together and we look at the amount of money that you spend as an institution or a state or a country on public education, we look at the amount of money that the students are spending in higher education, and we look at the results that the students get from the amount of money that's being spent. I think we would argue that the system we have today is by definition unsustainable, right? Or at least incredibly inefficient and we're not getting our money's worth. The ROI, if you will, is really, really bad. So I'll give you just a very quick example from my own state in K-12. My state only has, we're, relative, we're a large landmass, small population, Washington State. One million public school kids. It's tiny compared to most states. We spend about $134 million a year on educational resources for our 294 school districts. Some of the districts are big like Seattle. Some of them have nine kids in them. Okay, so it really varies. All of the school districts have local control. They all make their own decisions about when they buy content. They all have 12 grades, 13 if we add in kindergarten. They all have roughly eight subjects per grade, give or take. So we're looking at a grid of about 100 cells, 12 grades, eight subjects per grade, right? In any particular year, even though we're spending $134 million a year of public money, half of that comes from the state legislature, the other half comes from local property tax authority, which is public money, it's local taxes. Of those 100 cells, you would think with that much money, we could update, own, improve, collect data on all of that content. We, we don't. What we actually do is of the 100 cells we can afford in any of those districts to update somewhere between zero and two of those 100 cells every year. So I live in Olympia in the capital. My district, or Olympia school district last year updated two. We updated sixth grade biology and 10th grade math. And we said to the political science folks in 11th grade, we're sorry that the copyright date on your book is 1998. Hang in there. Because in three years, it's your turn. Your turn's coming. And you'll get updated, right? And so that's bad in and of itself. Here we are in the 21st century. We're spending over $100 million a year. And I've got stuff that's on average 11 years old. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is most of that stuff's print, not digital. So the kids can't, uh, kids can't use it on their devices. Not everybody has a device, but the ones that do can't access the content. And kids take good care of those. They do, which leads to the third problem which is kids lose stuff. I don't know about you, I have two young kids. Uh, my kids, one of my kids came home the other day on the bus, was missing a shoe, right? <laughs> That's funny, but when I go to parent, so my wife works on the, she's a veterinarian, but she volunteers on the PTA, right? So we go to these PTA meetings, and, uh, and sometimes there's orientations for new parents and their kids. And we live in the circuit on the West Coast where people come from Latin America, uh, and they come up as migrant workers and they pick the apples in Washington and other crops. And their kids come to our schools, which is a great thing. My kids hear Spanish and other languages all the time, and it's, it's a great mix of cultures and languages. And we really value that in our public school districts. I sit and I listen to these parents say to their children, we don't have a lot of money. You can't take your books from school to home and back, your paper books, because if you lose one, I just had to sign this document that says that I have to pay $150 to the school district to replace the book if you lose the book. We don't have $150. You can't, you're going to need to make friends with some rich kid and go and do homework at their home, right? And it's funny 
But mostly it's sad. But it's not. Yeah. It's not funny, right? And then for all the kids, rich or poor, at the end of the school year, what do we say to them? Give back all of your educational resources. Because why? Well, we've got to amortize the cost of these 12th or these seventh grade biology books over 10 years, so you can't take them with you to eighth grade. You can't have a copy. There's no perpetual use. And then we say to their teachers on top of that, we know that your political science book is copyrighted 1998, and that's no good. But I'm sorry, you can't update it because A, it's paper, and B, it's all rights reserved copyright. That's what my state buys for $134 million a year, right? So you want to talk about sustainability? That's the conversation we should start with. Now let's have the more interesting conversations. So for the last probably five years, uh, Creative Commons and many other organizations have been talking with national governments around the world, states and provinces, systems of education and institutions, and saying, let's start with not your big money, let's start with just your optional discretionary grants. And the reason we start there is that those are non-threatening. You're not, as David said, we're not going to force anybody to change. We're simply saying, if you want to take a grant from us, if you want a contract from us to do some work, which nobody's forcing you to do, but if you're going to ask for a grant, we're going to have a requirement on that grant that whatever you produce has to be under a Creative Commons license. So this started, frankly, with the Hewlett Foundation. The Hewlett Foundation said, if you take a grant from us, you will put a Creative Commons attribution license on what you build. If you don't agree to those terms, you can't have our money. Why did Hewlett say that? Hewlett said that because they want, when they build something, they don't just want the grantee to be able to use it. I mean, they give the copyright to the grantee, but they want everybody in the world to be able to use it. That's kind of the point. They're trying to do good work, and they're trying to maximize the positive impact of the grant that they're making out there into the world. The Gates Foundation followed suit and said, you know, we fund much of the global research on health, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and we now have a requirement that if you're an academic researcher and you take money from us to do research on, say, malaria or typhoid or polio, you have to publish in a journal that allows for a Creative Commons attribution license on the article and zero embargo period. So the whole world rich or poor, subscribe to the journal or not, everybody gets access to the academic research right away. Why? Because academic research and journals are supposed to be about sharing knowledge. It's not supposed to be only if you can afford to go to Harvard and can get access to Harvard's library. Right? And so we worked with, and, and I need to call out Department of Ed, Department of Ed, who's sitting here in the room for their leadership on this as well, early on in the US federal government, there was a major grant out of the US Department of Labor, and the Department of Education was helping to advise them on this. And the Department of Labor put out $2 billion. With a B. With a B, is a big number. Two US community colleges, right after the financial crash of 2008, to build degree programs at US community colleges to retrain American workers, to put them back to work where there were jobs. Right, and the US Department of Labor knows where there are jobs. That's kind of the business that they're in. Department of Education and others said, you know what, this is public money. This should be openly licensed. And so the Department of Labor required a Creative Commons attribution license on all $2 billion, anything that was built or revised with that public money. Department of Education then followed suit just this past year and adopted their own open licensing rules so that if you take a grant from the Department of Education, you have to openly license what you build, right? This makes sense because publicly funded resources should be openly licensed resources. We should get what we pay for. David likes to say if he walks in and he orders a pizza and they brought him the bill and he didn't get the pizza, are you going to be happy? No. He's I mean, I'll, I'll pay first. You'll That's pay okay. First, but you, you want your... But I eventually want to get a pizza. He wants his pizza, ladies and gentlemen. So when we pay for something, and this, I, so I would encourage those of you at institutions in positions of power here, when you give out grant money, please require a Creative Commons attribution license on what you build. So this is easy to do. Let me just say another word about the please pizza. Please go ahead about the pizza. How many colleges and universities are there in Maryland? Thank you. I knew it was a lot. <laughs> they don't know. Let's say it's 50-ish, okay? So I'm a... 56. So if I were a taxpayer and I lived in Maryland, and I knew that there are 56 different institutions whose libraries had gone out and paid 56 different times, or maybe you do it as a consortium or something, 
to access, to provide access to a research journal, it had an article in it. My, my, ta my federal tax dollars had funded that research to get it done, and I've paid for it 56 times for people in my state to have access to it, and I still can't read it because I'm not affiliated with an institution. That's what I mean by, when you pay for pizza, you should get a pizza. When you fund the creation of the work and you fund access to it over and over and over and over again, how is it that you still do not have the rights to read that article? Publicly funded resources should be publicly available resources. Well said. Well, you, get, you get all the applause? You get going. I think you're funnier than I am. <laughs> Looks aren't everything. <heavy. laughs> so this is where we started. We started on the optional money, and this is the new conversation. We're having this conversation with governments around the world. I just got back from Slovenia a few, what, a few months ago it was, where we convened the world's ministries of education. And they came together. This was a, a UNESCO meeting, and it was called the Second World OER Congress. And at that meeting, this is what the world's ministries of education wanted to talk about. They said, yeah, 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 of course we should do this. Of course we should have open educational licensing policies. We'll do that. But what we really want to talk about is looking at the big money. In our countries, we spend billions of dollars every year in money that goes to support public education. And as David said, how does it make any sense, so I'll give you another example from my state, how does it make any sense that the 34 community colleges in Washington State spend $8.5 million every year buying English 101 books just for the community college students? So that's a real number, folks. Now, the good news is that doesn't happen anymore because my state shifted to OER on those books, and now they spent money once. They put a CC BY license on it, and now everybody can use it. We don't spend $8.4 billion a year. But open procurement, the idea is, how do we actually take an honest look at what we spend? So if I was sitting down with UMUC, we would say, how much does UMUC spend in financial aid packages that goes to student, and what percentage of that financial aid goes to buying instructional materials? Let's figure that out. Let's figure out how much money comes through state financial aid grants into those students. Let's figure out how much Pell Grant money and Stafford subsidized loans is coming in to supporting students. Let's take account of all of these funds, and then let's look at the cash that's coming out of students' pockets, which we know is contributing to the share in, what is it now, $1.4 trillion of student debt in this country? I think that's what we're up to. Um, and debt that cannot be disposed of even in bankruptcy when people have a tough time in their lives. How do, let's look at all of this money, and how could we not do what we're doing today, but instead do open? What would that look like? So how do we, as people that control those flows of money, not lease what we need, because that's what the publishers would like us to do. They'd like us to pay a lease fee for a short period of time to get access to lock down all rights reserved copyrighted content that you've got no permissions to change, that you lose access to, and lose access to, and it's got technical protection measures on it, so you can't make copies, you can't redistribute it. How do we switch from that to buying what we need and owning what we buy, and very specifically I mean own the copyright, and then put a CC license on what you own. So what would it look like for my state, instead of spending $134 million a year and getting the lousy results we get in K-12, what if we took $100 million, so we're already spending $135 a year, what if we took $100 million, and we've got those 100 cells, sixth grade biology, 10th grade political science, et cetera. What if the state of Washington put out 100 $1 million RFPs? These are open RFPs. Anybody is welcome to reply. We invite Pearson and McGraw-Hill and the math department at UMUC and University of Maryland to apply as well. We don't care who builds sixth grade math. We want the best product at the best price. The deal is, the new deal, the new open procurement deal, is that the state of Washington is going to buy it. They are going to own it. They're going to hold the copyright. The vendor, UMUC's math department, is the vendor. Or Pearson is the vendor. Or McGraw is the vendor. We will pay you a lot of money. We'll even give you a maintenance contract to keep those materials up to date. But we're going to own it, and we're going to put a CC license on it and make it OER. And now my state spent $100 million once. Maybe we give 25% contracts for maintenance. That's the sustainability piece. 
We always keep it up to date. And now my state ongoing spend is $25 million a year, not $134. I can pay teachers higher. I can have more pre-K. I can lower class sizes. I can do more interesting things with the money. But more important, or as important, all of my kids have up-to-date resources. They're not 10 years out of date. I've got paper and print for everybody. All of my teachers have full legal rights to do 5R materials. Every kid builds a library as they go through my schools. Nobody's taking materials away. Everybody gets to keep it. Those migrant families which are coming into our schools in Washington State, they tell their kids, take your books home. Here's five digital versions. And the teachers tell those kids, if you lose a book, don't worry about it. You don't have to tell your teachers or your parents. We've got a stack in the corner over here because they cost five bucks a piece to print. Go grab yourself a new one. You want to put stickers on them and highlight, and make them your own so you can learn better? Go for it. And we're spending a quarter, we're spending one sixth of what we used to spend. That's what we can do when we shift to open procurement. Here, I finally got an applause. Now I realize that's scary. I realize that the existing empires out there do not like this conversation and they will fight you. When you need support, call us. We'll show up at your doorstep and we'll help. <laughs> Here are a few things just to close it out that you can do today at your institutions. One is to have events like this, not only statewide, but at your institutions. Why? Because 75% of the faculty in the United States of America still don't know what OER is. They can't define it. They don't understand CC licensing. They just don't know. It's not their fault. Nobody's ever told them. Okay, this is relatively new stuff. Second thing, as David said, the colleges need to support the faculty that choose to move this way. Don't force anybody to do anything they don't want to do. You're just going to get in academic freedom fights. It's not worth it. Moreover, you don't have to. All that, the, all that the college leadership, all that the deans, all that the faculty senate, all that the student leadership need to do is to stand up and say, folks, we have a problem. Here are the highest 100 enrolled courses at University of Maryland. Here are the enrollments in each one of those courses. Here's the textbook cost, average cost in each one of these courses. For these 100 courses at University of Maryland, we're spending $58 million a year. That's a problem. How do we solve the problem? Faculty want to help solve the problem? Come see us. We've got resources to provide you release time. We've got a new OER librarian that can help you find stuff. We've got, we'll make sure that stuff's copyright cleared so there's no violations. Provide that support. Get funding. So your senator stood up here and said that they provided $100,000. That's a great start. New York just put down $8 million. California plunked down $5 million. They're about to put down another several million. The US Department of Education has a new open licensing policy. They put out lots of money every year that has open license requirements on it now. They provide money uh, all over the place around building educational resources and new programs. Leverage that support and don't try to do this alone. My state built the entire gen ed curriculum for community colleges as OER. Should you go out and spend $100 million doing the same thing? Start with ours, right? Revise, remix. If you need to change it, go ahead and change it. You need to also look at your promotion and tenure uh, possibilities. Faculty in the room, put your hands up. Faculty, keep your hands up if your behavior is somewhat modified by the rules of promotion and tenure. <laughs> right? <laughs> we pay attention to promotion and tenure. If it says we have to publish six articles, we publish six articles. If it says we have to write a book chapter, we do that thing. Right? If it says in promotion and tenure that you get positive points, not negative points, Positive points when we publish in open access journals because more people around the world can read our research and we have greater impact, then we're going to consider publishing in open access journals. If it says that when we share our content as OER and we put a CC license on it, that not only are we helping students, we're reducing dropout rates, we're reducing student debt, we're decreasing time to degree because students are taking more credits. We know all these things happen. And we know that we are increasing our service to the community because if I share my OER at the University of Maryland, UMUC might pick it up. And the community colleges in the state might pick it up. And I also might help, up, help out Vermont along the way. And these are all good things, and I get credit for that in promotion and tenure. Then faculty will be more incented to move this direction. So you've got to pay attention. Get your deans together. Get your faculty senate together. Get your student leadership together. Call a committee and look at your P&T. And the last thing, a little plug for something we've done, we've put together something called the Creative Commons Open Education Platform. There's no membership fee, doesn't cost anything to join. Go to Google and type in Creative Commons Open Education Platform, it'll be the first link. 
and you can join us. This is a global community, and our purview is to look at building projects and services that don't just affect one state or one province or even one country. We're building multinational projects, curriculum, systems that everybody needs to support open education. If you want to join those conversations and uh, collude with your colleagues around the world, you're most welcome to join. And at that, we're going to stop and check with MJ and see if we have time for any Q&A. A couple of quick questions for Coach Lutz. You want a water? Yeah. I told you all you were in for a treat. Thank you both so much. Uh, we have one question. He's got his arm straight up right here, so let's go to you first. But there's a microphone, if you don't mind walking, just around that table. Thank you. We are, by the way, going to penalize uh, you for a little time against lunch uh, because we're running a little bit over. I'll explain that in a minute. Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay, I'm about 75 years old. Uh, I applaud your vision of this brave new world, um, but I'm not my department. I'm not my institution. I'm not my state. So, and you don't have to answer this right now, but what I hope to learn in this conference is how I can do this as a Lone Ranger, how I can get involved even if I don't have support from the top. Thank you for that. I think you will be learning about that today. You guys want to? Yeah, well, attend the, the short answer is attend the concurrent sessions that are about to follow. Yeah. Because th there's absolutely a path forward. When I s said a minute ago, adopt first and then think about the rest of it. Talk to me, th talk, th talk to me or Cable afterward. Tell us what discipline you teach and we'll, we'll point you on the path. And one really easy first step, and this again came from student leadership around the country, was students ran a campaign to sit down with faculty and very simply in about 10 minute time frame say, this is what OER is, here's why it's important to us, and we have an ask of you, the faculty member. Before you assign your next textbook for next semester or two semesters away, before you put that bookstore order in, would you please just take a look? We're not asking you to adopt, we're just asking you to look at OER that's available, open textbooks that are available for your discipline. And we, the students with the librarian, will even go do that legwork for you and bring you two or three options for what you teach. And if you'd be willing to review it, that's the ask. And what we see out of that, if you, if you do that, you give the faculty about a half hour of professional development, and if you give the faculty about $250 to review those materials, so you give them just a thank you for your time, we get about 30 to 35 percent adoption rates of open textbooks from that accommodation. Other questions? All right, well, join me again in thanking Cable and David. <laughs>